This episode of The Minimalists is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are The Minimalists. Ryan, I love you. I love you more. <laughs> Not possible, but we'll explain why on today's episode. <laughs> Click here to find out why Brian doesn't love Josh more. Rebecca, I love you. I love you. We have Rebecca Shern here today. Bex, uh, just started a new podcast. It's called How to Love. So today we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about relationships, Aww. sex, and parenting. I think well, those things will make their way into it as well. Now, the name of the podcast uh, she was gracious enough to ask me to be her co-host. Mm -hmm. It's an audio-only podcast. And so um, we've been talking about love. Now, the name of the podcast is How to Love. Mm -hmm. But, of course, that's just a Trojan horse. There's some, it's irony, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, because it's not like the seven-step plan <laughs> to love. Mm -hmm. Although I wish, th wouldn't that be awesome? If there was a set. Dude, there, it would be awesome if there was like a seven-step plan for a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and there, there are. And it worked. There are for really like sort of rudimentary things, right? You, sure. You've got, you know, getting out of debt or, or losing weight. Like there are some really solid how-tos out there. Mm -hmm. when we're talking about love, though. We're talk talking about understanding mm. love. We're talking about exploring love. And that's what I want to explore with you and the audience today. I think we have a language problem. Now, Bex and I, we talked about this on the first episode of How to Love. Really, there is, you know, when I say I love you, mm -hmm. now I might leave here later today and say, I love burritos, mm. right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, that's... What I really mean is I enjoy the flavor of burritos, right? Mm -hmm. And in our new book, Love People Use Things, there's this whole section in there called Love is More. You know, it's sort of a play on less is more. And in that section, we, we sort of try to give a, a definition of love. And I found there isn't a, a, there's not a great definition for love, especially when we're talking about how to be loving or what it entails to understand love. It's a rather circuitous path to, to get there. So I'm not going to read the, the whole excerpt here, but um, the, the part in the book that really makes sense for this conversation is this. Uh, we're talking about well, the definition of love. One love involves bottomless devotion birthed from deep affection. The other is a preference or fondness for something enjoyable. So I love Bex, but I also love tacos, right? All right. And, and so one is about this devotion. The other is about, I enjoy this thing. There's nothing wrong with that, right? It's just, it, it's a, a word that we use, but we use it rather flippantly. And I think that most of us don't actually understand love. Uh, and, and then there's the distinction between loving someone and being in love with them. The same word, two utterly different meanings. In the book, I go on to explain how... Um, the dialect, the Inuit dialect in Canada has up to, at least, or up to 53 words to describe snow. Mm. And I wish we had that for love. Isn't that cr Like, the English language uh -huh. has the most words in it. Yeah, I was yeah. just thinking the same thing. Out of any language. But, but we have one word for love. We have one word for love. But what's interesting, though, in other languages, they have many words for love. Right. Yeah, especially you go back to, to the sort of mm. romance languages and the roots and yeah. uh, Latin and, and, and Greek, and you start to understand that they're, they do have different descriptors. Yeah. It's, you know, the American language relies a lot on context. Right. And, yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's good in the sense that we don't have to ha add more words, but when it comes to something like love, uh -huh. it, it muddles things a little bit. Right, and it makes it harder to understand, which is ironic because love is ultimately, or at least a big component of it, is about understanding, mm -hmm. understanding the way things are, understanding the other person. And Bex, I think with our relationship, the thing that works so well is that we understand each other. Yeah, and we always seek to better understand each other. Right. right. There's never an uh, a place where we reach like, oh, we understand each other. We get each other. It's like, no, we understand that we're continually changing mm -hmm. and we're going to continue to have to like adjust and learn 
each other's new preferences. And now, Ryan and I had a conversation the other day about commitment, mm. right? And I loved, you and I had a, a similar conversation. It was just not in front of microphones at the time. And it was after I got home and I had been speaking to Ryan on the podcast about commitment and how when you have a deep desire for something, it actually does not require commitment. And I mm -hmm. think sometimes we confuse love or being in a relationship with someone, a marriage, even a friendship, mm -hmm. as though you have to be committed to that person. Mm -hmm. And you said something that I think would offend most people, but it really made me just... just uh, overjoyed to hear you're like i've never committed to you <laughs> <laughs> can you expand on that <laughs> yeah i mean i i don't think i would have thought of it had the conversation not come up mm -hmm. but like no it's never been a commitment i've never made this like well josh and i were in it for life uh -huh. like better for better or worse mm -hmm. like to death do its part it's like no like we're we choose to be together because we work well together yeah. in so many different ways. And um, that doesn't involve a commitment. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel the same way about uh, like Ryan and I have a business together. We also have a friendship together and mm -hmm. those things are uh, intertwined. They, they can't not be right. Right. Um, but Ryan, I, I never feel like I'm committing to you mm -hmm. it, it, in a way. It almost feels like, you're getting up at 5 a.m. to jog in the morning. I'm committed to this new habit or whatever. Yeah. I don't feel that way w with you. I don't feel as though I must commit. Maybe that's a better way to say it. Yeah. Hmm. It's interesting because uh, what's coming up for me right now is when I think about Mariah and I, um, which is so nice that I can talk about our relationship and she's not here to uh, <laughs> to, to deny anything. <laughs> no, actually, I don't. Yeah, she should be here. I would make her I agree with e everything I say. Yeah, no, no. no. Um, actually, I wish she was here to, to expound on this a little bit more. But uh, with Mariah, I love her deeply and I want to understand her. So I search for understanding where she comes from. Yes. Where I get stuck and where I get caught up is when I get when I feel misunderstood or uh, so that feeling can lead to anger. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I'm emotional, emotional like that, whether I'm upset or angry or whatever, that negative feeling, sometimes I forget that I'm trying to understand her mm. because the emotion will overtake and interrupt that deep love that I have for her. Right. And it's almost like, and it's usually after I act like a jerk that I'll go back and be like, you know what? I really wasn't seeking to understand you then. And you know, I, I want you to know that I do want to understand, or I, I do want to understand you, but I, I guess it, it's, it goes back to this word commitment because it's almost like, because what you're talking about is this free flow state of just being with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are times when that, for me, when that state gets interrupted. Mm -hmm. And I have to remind it's it's but it's almost like that word commitment when it does come up, I'm like, you're really upset right now, but like you are committed to understanding, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah. So yeah, it's interesting how um you know, ninety percent, ninety five percent of Mariah and I's relationship is free flow. Uh -huh. But that word commitment will come up for me personally uh -huh. because that stake gets interrupted. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I think what you're bringing up, though, as that gets interrupted again and again, it sounds to me like what you're saying is you get better at understanding each time. You know, you're mm -hmm. sort of developing that understanding muscle. In a I way. wish I was getting better at it. So you're getting worse <laughs> at it. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm huh. kidding. No, I, I mean, to your point of like things are always constantly moving and changing. Uh -huh. So you have to adjust. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I think I'm probably getting better at it, but there's always some kind of new understanding that uh, pops up, I guess, whether, mm -hmm. you know, it's on the horizon or whatever. But uh, but yeah, I, I was I was kind of saying that tongue in cheek. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a definition here from uh, the book. I skip ahead a page or two. If you consult your nearest dictionary, you'll find that love has several meanings, an intense feeling of deep affection, a great interest and pleasure in someone, a person or a thing that one loves. But my favorite definition is one I never thought much about. The fourth entry in the New Oxford American Dictionary defines love as a tennis term. Love, a score of zero. 
Ooh. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I love that. I forgot about that part in the book. Oh. In, in the context of a tennis match, that means one thing. But as a broader metaphor, it means everything. Mm. Real love. When removed from the desires and commodification of the modern world does not keep score. There's no balance sheet, no barometer, no measuring stick for love. Yeah. But too often it feels like we are often creating these these measuring sticks, mm-hmm. aren't we? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, and, and I think they manifest well, in a bunch of different ways. Well, it's funny because, like, you know, uh, I, this is how I used to approach it. And there's a Seth Godin article that does a much better job of explaining what I'm about to. And I have searched for this article left and right. And, like, I have I've spent hours searching for it. I cannot find it. But okay. he, he talks about how keeping score in a relationship is a zero-sum game. Uh-huh. And... I'm going to, again, I'm going to try and explain this, but I'm not going to do a very good job. But uh, when Mariah comes home and let's say I'm on the couch and I'm like, oh, uh, Mariah's home. I'm really excited to see her. She's going to come over here and give me a kiss. But instead she picks up the cat and she shows affection to the cat. And then I'm like, what the heck, man? Like I'm over here on the couch. So I've got this expectation that she doesn't even know about. And then you know, as she's petting the cat, I'm like, but I came home yesterday and I went right to her <laughs> and gave her a kiss. So now I'm keeping score uh-huh. of who does what for who. And the problem is that if you are keeping score, eventually, especially because these are expectations that our partners don't even know about sometimes. Sure. You start, like, it's a zero, it, it eventually gets to a zero level where you're going to feel like, you're, you're going to feel like you're doing more in the relationship than the other person. Uh-huh. And, uh, yeah, that's just, that's the danger of keeping score. But I love this idea, love, this idea of love being a score of zero because it doesn't start off with this meter. It just, it's, it starts at zero, Yeah. which is, um, yeah. So from there you can only add. Yeah. In a way, I think, you know, the one thing that makes our relationship great, and I I would say the same thing about, uh, Ryan, yours and my relationship is I feel like we show up full and we're not sh- we're not expecting to be filled by the other person. No. No. Yes. Well, sometimes Bex is <laughs> <laughs> Hey oh like oh this just went this just went parental advisory. <laughs> uh yeah. You know, I was actually thinking about what love makes me really want to do and it's it's uh it's about showing up for the other person, mm. about supporting the other person. And I think like that is for me is a, it's a, it's a truer definition of love. Not because, you know, we talk about unconditional love, which I think is overrated. Mm. Unconditional love is overrated. Okay. Um, And I've talked about this before and I'll tell the story again real quick. Uh, Bex, I don't know if you've actually heard this, but like my, so my brother, he, he uh, he came over in Montana, meet him and my family. And uh, we were having a nice little week vacation together. And he was just like, treating me like garbage treating the whole family like garbage i don't know what anger he was holding in but it was like this projection of anger and at a certain point i was like what is your problem man what do you mean we're family you know we we can do whatever we want i'm like i have friends that treat me better than you treat me yeah but they're friends and i'm family i'm like right so you should treat me better than my friends right and that's like he had nothing he's like oh yeah i see what you're saying but the problem (laughs) is that 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 unconditional love yeah. gave him permission to treat everyone like garbage oh yeah. you have to love me right because i'm your family right. and, and it's uh yeah it's 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 overrated i feel like in some ways i, I would say that, that he probably doesn't understand that that's not a loving way to behave right because yeah. I- I- if if he was being if if he understood love in fact, I would make the argument that unconditional love is the only kind of love that exists. Hmm. Uh, uh, conditional love becomes then transactional love, well, and I, and you must fulfill these the the sort of terms of service mm. a, in order for me to love you. Um, that's a long discussion. Maybe we can get to that on the maximal because we have a bunch of questions to get to today. Yeah, well, it goes back to the definition, right? Right. So unconditional love, I think, is oftentimes used how my brother was using it. 
mm. where you're coming from with unconditional love is a it sounds like a completely different definition yeah yeah and, and i don't want to get caught up on the definition right yeah. yeah i think unconditional love is often used to excuse bad behavior yeah 100 percent. it Tweet within, that podcast within Sean. relationships yeah. yeah yeah no that's uh, that's absolutely true but for me again like the the, the love that i truly feel and experience it doesn't require any taking yes yeah th- th- that's it and that's why it is the sort of the score of zero well the podcast is called how to love how to love dot show is where you can find it uh it's like <laughs> instead of dot net or whatever i i was uh uh I, I saw your post so i went to patreon and i typed in how to love to uh-huh. to go support bex and it the first thing that popped up was how to cat <laughs> <laughs> so I signed up for that instead. I'm sorry, Bex. <laughs> right. I understand. <laughs> uh, the book is called Love People Use Things. It's available for pre-order right now. LovePeopleUseThings.net. We have a question here from Maureen in London, England. I recently got out of a six-year relationship. Um, my partner was living with me for the last 18 months of that relationship. And despite being devastated when it ended, less than two months on, I really can see the relationship for what it was and actually it was a really um wise to not be in that relationship anymore and to not settle for anything less than what i deserve um i think it's been a really good learning experience however what i'm really conscious of looking at this relationship and previous relationships is that i seem to be making the same errors when i'm with someone and i'm allowing the relationship to drag on for longer than it should rather than letting go of it a lot earlier. It would be good to hear your thoughts on how you um, make sure that your feelings of love for someone don't cloud your judgment about the reality of a relationship and how you can kind of just stay down to earth about it even after a long-term relationship. So Maureen, I applaud you for asking a question like this because it sounds to me like if I were to rephrase the question, how do you recognize when it's time to end a relationship mm. or, or what are the, the sort of red flags? Is that what you heard, Bex? Yeah. Let's talk about this. Yeah. So I heard myself in Maureen's question, <laughs> to be mm-hmm. honest, my former self. Okay. Um, and I might be now just superimposing my experience onto hers. So apologies, Maureen, if this is totally not what you were looking for. What are you talking about? That's exactly what Josh and I do. (laughs) (laughs) This is what we do That's that's the the only thing we do on this podcast is superimpose our experience on other people's. Right. (laughs) Um, So, you know, she she had the six-year relationship. Um, Only 18 months of it at the very end was them living together. Mm. So what I'm going to guess is that at the start, she was like, "Mm, yeah, you know, this person is someone I enjoy. I, you know, have a few similarities with, like, maybe they have great sex or maybe they, you know, have a lot of snow activities they like to yeah. do, snowboarding. Maybe or, they got kids. Or, yeah, maybe they had kids early on. Mm. Um, or they get attached to kids from yeah. the other person's re- former relationships. Yeah, so there are lots of reasons why you might get attached early to someone. Mm. But at least in my experience, especially with my my first marriage, is like there are definitely red flags in relationships that are not going to work, mm. right? Yeah. And they usually happen early on. I don't remember. I feel like I don't remember who said it, but like the idea of when people show you who they are, believe them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And you often see exactly who people are even within the first two months mm. or the first six months, mm-hmm. definitely within the first year. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I think at least what I've often done is discount the negative, like make excuses for the red flags. Like, Mm. oh, it was just, you know, a one-time thing or that was a rough situation or they were really upset or Mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Explaining it away. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Giving them, giving myself permission to not see the red flag. Mm because I don't want to see it. Mm-hmm. I, what I want is this relationship to work because more than anything else, I wanted to be in a relationship. Mm. Yeah, you want the warm and fuzzies. Yeah. So to get to those warm and fuzzies, you got to ignore the bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess the the like fundamental part of this question is, or the fundamental part of how you recognize when it's time to end a relationship, 
see the red flags yeah. and don't try to explain them away <coughs> and don't examine them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Examine them, see them, understand them mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and realize that they're probably not going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. A- a- and so then the question then becomes that, are you willing to pay that cost? That is the cost of admission, right? Right. Yeah. Something else I heard in Maureen's question is it's almost like she saw the red flags. So she knew it was time to go, but she couldn't let go. And I was thinking about, you know, uh, cause you know, I'm still in advice mode, Josh. I'm like, how could I, well, what advice could I give someone who's like, I'm in a bad relationship. I know it's not working out, but it's too hard to let go. Cause that's the story of every relationship leading up to Mariah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, to, to the point where I would like self I would self sabotage because then the, they would have to leave me. In what ways? Oh, uh, like I was a serial cheater. Uh-huh. Like you know, just yeah, really frosted flakes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Graham, <laughs> mm, Count Chocula. This episode is brought to you by cereal. Anyway, <laughs> um, so so it's uh it's interesting because there's always like this black or white choice I feel like I've always had Mm. that is so difficult you stay and you get a little bit of the warm and fuzzies but you got to put up with all the red flags and all the the BS Mm -hmm. or you have to leave yes and as I was thinking this I'm like wait a minute like there's not just two options Mm. like if you find yourself in a relationship like it's and people do this like they step away they separate for a little bit yes but you know if you're I think for me the red flag is if you're in a relationship and you're experiencing some of this discontent or you're not feeling great about the relationship ask yourself would I be happier without this person and if the initial feeling is I think I might be happier without this person Mm -hmm. then maybe it is time to to choose a third option Mm -hmm. and uh yeah I mean I I guess I'm just trying to give permission for people to let go when they find themselves in a situation like this I love I love the letting go part especially here because Letting go isn't something you do. It's something you stop doing. You stop tolerating the nonsense you're talking about mm-hmm. here, right? The, yeah. the, you stop you accepting. Stop on. Yeah, you stop, uh, you stop hanging on. You stop accepting the red flags for what they were. Or t- in order to let go of them, you can change your beliefs around those as well. Because sometimes I think quite often what needs to happen in these scenarios is I need to do a better job understanding my beliefs around something it, it it may not be the truth it may just be some way that i've been indoctrinated to to believe that you are supposed to you know, whatever fill in the blank not drink or you are supposed to drink in order for us to have a, a relationship so we can go out together wh- whatever it is mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but these are just beliefs right a- and so sometimes letting go of the beliefs can save the relationship i was clinging to the 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 to disempowering beliefs Mm. yeah i think at the end of the day i'm going to pick up on your beloved phrase i am honored sorry at the end of the day it's like it just like comes (laughs) this way at the end of the day yeah osmosis i saw this meet anyway actually i I won't derail this i won't derail this bex please (laughs) (laughs) um i think that for me anyways what's been helpful with figuring out when it's time to end a relationship is listening to your intuition, right? And listening yeah. to those those internal cues that are telling you like, this this isn't the right place to right. be. Um, yeah, and you get there by a combination of, you know, the red flags and thinking about whether or not you'd be happier by yourself or not. Or, yeah. Um, well, she yeah. did say that she sometimes worries that love clouds judgment. Ooh. And I would say there are three components to any relationship. We talk about this in Love People Use Things. Yeah. Uh, and, and initially got this from our friend Chris Ryan, uh, who wrote the book Sex at Dawn, wrote Civilized to Death. Yeah. And his concept of relationships involves sort of a three-legged table, right? Mm-hmm. And it requires all three legs to hold up the table. Mm-hmm. Uh, too often, we fulfill one or two of these legs and the other one's either short or missing Mm -hmm. and so the the table falls over so the first one is chemistry and that's the thing that makes the relationship really easy up front right because you have that the chemistry sexual chemistry or just enjoy being around each other the new love the same music yeah yeah right there's 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 a particular energy there at Mm -hmm. the onset of a relationship yeah and that can last for a long time that flame burns hot 
Um, but it it does stay lit for a while. And I say a long time. It could be a month, two months, six months, a year. But eventually, if the relationship is predicated solely on chemistry, we know what that what ha- there are whole sitcoms that are <laughs> that are dedicated to exposing this lie of life. Well, this makes me think. You said love clouds the judgment. Uh huh. But what she, yeah, Marine yeah, that's said. what that's what she's saying. But it's almost like it's the pleasure that clouds the judgment. Exactly. That we confuse for love. Bingo. Yeah. Or, or we could even say the chemistry here. Yeah. So the second component yeah, yeah. is compatibility. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The third component is love. Mm. I, now, of all of those, love is the one we understand the least. Again, I think love, it, it, it really involves a deep understanding, acceptance, and appreciation, not of the way you hope things to be, but of the way things are, warts and all. Uh, not trying to change the other person, that's not loving, that's coercion. Remember when Mike Tyson yell, was yelling at the reporter, I'm going to fuck you till you love me. <laughs> but that's how we treat relationships. Mm. Uh, maybe fig- literally, but I'm, I mean figuratively. It's like, I'm going to persuade you, force you, drag you into love with me. Mm. But, but you can't induce love. Love doesn't work that way. Now, compatibility, on the other hand, I think that might be the most difficult of yeah. the three components. In fact, yeah. it's the reason that I think most marriages or relationships, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, partnerships, they they carry on for such a, she, she talked about six years. Mm. Well, compati- being incompatible is, is easy to deal with. But you don't want to deal with it. Imagine having to deal with your relationship, yeah. right? Like, it's like, what do you do? Pain management for your relationship? No, of course you don't want to deal with your relationship. Mm-hmm. You want your relationship to be thriving. Yeah. Can I add something here? Of course, you're the guest. I think <laughs> that one of the things that we struggle with with compatibility in romantic relationships, in particular, is the idea that we're really incompatible with almost everyone we're around all the time, mm-hmm. right? And so we're used to being incompatible. We're used to trying to navigate like the weird th- places where things don't sync up right, where you don't see eye to eye. We're mm. used to trying to quote unquote make it work, Oof. right? Mm. And so we then transfer that to romantic relationships and we put up with being incompatible with people that we, you know, we, we, we get, we have chemistry with them mm-hmm. And eventually maybe the chemistry evolves into some sort of love Mm -hmm. and we're kind of compatible. Right, right, right. right. But it's not. It's not working. Right. The the, the table is wobbly. Yeah. Yep. I'm just really grateful for uh, OkCupid's algorithm. uh, (laughs) That's the first thing that like drew me to Mariah was because when she reached out to me, she had no pro. There was no profile. Yeah. She just like filled out the questionnaire. But we were like a 92 or 93 percent match. And I was like, oh, like, I know that I have no idea what this person looks like, but uh, she did end up, like, emailing me a picture or something. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. It was uh, <laughs> it was just a picture of an eggplant. <laughs> no, but... Uh, but From but, her garden. But, it's, but, but I, I actually am being serious. Like, there is, like, algorithms out there to help you. Um, I'm not saying everyone can rely on these, but that is, it was the compatibility part that really made me excited about going on that first date with Mariah. I'm like, yeah. we are 93%. This is the highest match yeah. that I've had on this website. And every date I went up to or uh, went on leading up to that, you know, it was like 85, 86%. And it was always like good, good compatibility. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's, it, there is an algorithm that totally like helped Mariah and I get together based on compatibility. And if you're looking for another sort of algorithm, maybe a deeper algorithm, something Mm -hmm. deeper than an algorithm, Yes, we have a a values worksheet on our website, theminimalists.com slash V. And there is an essay there about understanding your values. It's a free worksheet. You can download it. It actually stemmed from Bex and I. We we started writing out our values on like notepads and Apple Notes and stuff. And eventually we, we, we discovered... Uh, talking with Ryan as well, there are f- these four different types of values. Mm. Well, three, and then there's imaginary values. And we go into detail on that. But mm. understanding what your values are can help with that compatibility component as well. Mm. Because if you val- value 
everything different from your partner, is there going to be much compatibility there? No, of course not. Mm. So theminimalists.com slash V, you can download the free values worksheet over there and read the essay about understanding your values. We're running out of time, so I'm going to go past Billy's question because I want to make time, well, for what time it is right now, Ryan. What time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937-202-4654. Shout out to everyone who's been sending us pictures of what they're decluttering recently. So many people taking the less is now challenge after watching the film. And so they're posting it with the hashtag less is now on social media, tagging us. We're just at the minimalists. But also uh, Bex and I have been doing the the challenge as well this month. Um, Day 31 will surprise you. I'll tell you that. Um, And uh, day 32 will surprise you with. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, uh, uh, you can follow Bex at minimal wellness on Instagram to see how our family is decluttering, or you can just send us a, a text message with what you are letting go of this month. By the way, those texts go to both my phone and Ryan's phone. We respond to quite a few of them and we respond to some on the podcast. Now, during the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I and our guests, we do our best to answer every question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place, minimalmaxims.com. We have a special question today, Ryan. From our MVP, official TK Coleman. That's right. He's official. He is official. Eight-time podcast guest. Is he? Yeah. He, he holds the record. That's awesome. By a long I love shot. TK. I wish he was here in person to, to ask this question. He asks, do you ever passionately disagree about important decisions that affect the entire family? For example, where should we live? Where should we send our child to school, etc.? If so, how do you handle compromise and conflict resolution? Ooh. Ooh, Bex, how do you handle compromise and conflict resolution? God, I love this question. Um, TK, you're, geni- you're a genius. Um, you know, you and I, mm-hmm. I have to say, we don't often passionately disagree. That's true. Um, and we don't we can often... start if you'd like. Yeah, I know, right? Shut <laughs> up. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't so, imagine. So, yeah, I, I think at least for us, part of this question is kind of hard. Yeah. Because I, I think part of the there there are several reasons why we don't passionately disagree. First of all, we're hyper compatible, mm-hmm. um, and the stuff that we're not quote unquote compatible about. Yes. Uh, per, you know, for example, um, affinity for nature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tolerance of dirt. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, like <laughs> we Max both loves appreciate. Camping and Josh hates pretending that he's homeless. <laughs> <laughs> we both <laughs> we both appreciate where the other is coming from, yeah. right? And like I'm not gonna try to bully you into doing something my way or vice versa. It's definitely not. Um, and so I think there's a certain uh, go, going back to the understanding thing. Understanding your your partner's preferences. Yeah. Right. And not trying to force your preferences on your partner. That's my actually my pithy answer here is because he asked where where should we live? Where should we send our child to school? My pithy answer is is rather pithy. It's just there is no should. There never was. Mm. These shoulds, even the ones he describes, are really good examples of 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 common problems that come up in a relationship. Mm. And it's because they're they're problems only because we believe they're shoulds. We put this like pressure on ourselves to right. do something when there was the only pressure that exists is what we have put on it yes yeah a hundred percent of the time and so these are these shoulds are all manufactured Mm -hmm. and and it's really saying well i have a preference to send our kid to this school you have a preference for that school and and, in bex's in my relationship i know that we could talk about that and then we as, as we communicate we do a better job of understanding like okay what what are your beliefs around this? What are my beliefs around it? And how do I untangle those beliefs to get to some sort of essence? Yeah. yeah. Bex, I like what you have written here. 
Did you did you say this? Did you say your pithy answer? I didn't say my pithy. Okay, so yet. you say your pithy answer first because mine is very <laughs> similar to yours, and I don't want to steal your thunder. Oh, you're so sweet. <laughs> I do what I can. Um, okay, so my pithy answer is respect and appreciation help us find compromise and resolve conflict. Yes. So I totally agree with that. So mine is disagreements are easier to solve when we approach them with love and understanding. So this makes me think about this word passionately inserted here before the word disagree. And I think what happens is we get passionate about an emotion that we have or a belief or whatever it is. So then we project that's, that's what the passion means to me. Cause you know, this is this passionate here Mm -hmm. before disagree is not, this sounds like a pejorative to me. It doesn't sound like something Mm -hmm. positive. So I think if you approach any disagreement or any decision, major decision with, uh, with love, with understanding, with respect, with appreciation, I think uh, you can actually just have a disagreement and not a passionate disagreement. Right. Right. But you know, it's it's interesting. I have this little aside here with. I'm sorry. Were you going to say something? No. Okay. No. Cool. You're disagreeing with me. Awesome. Totally. All right. Sweet. <laughs> so uh, my my little aside here is that with disagreements, we often try when we're passionately disagreeing. We often try to convince someone of something. Mm. And uh, I love that Josh and I are trying to get away from from the convincing business. Yes. So uh, if you're trying to convince someone, there's probably something wrong. And when we have these passionate disagreements, even worse, we might actually, to a certain degree, be trying to take something away from someone, Mm -hmm. Uh, whether it's an idea or a preference or uh, a point of view. So... um, Really, uh, you know, what I what I have written here is like an argument is best solved when both sides are trying to find a way to give rather than take. And if, mm. if both people can approach it in that way, you can get through these disagreements. Mm. So instead of trying to convince someone or to take someone's idea away, really approach. And this is what I do with Mariah because it actually makes me feel because of the, the love I have for her. It makes me feel so good to like give her something. So when we have a disagreement and uh, that emotion isn't clouding my, <laughs> my, my, my judgment at that time. I, you know, I can get into a space a lot of the times where I'm like, oh, she's asking for something that I want to give her. And then once she sees me giving her something, she will then in turn give me something back. So uh, yeah, um, TK, great question. Uh, I know that him and his wife are not passionately disagreeing about a lot of things though. <laughs> Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. they seem like a very awesome couple. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're, they're wonderful. Uh, I, I will say that you know the word compromise st- stood out to me, Bex, and maybe we could talk about that because uh, I want to echo what Ryan said here with respect to arguing. I, I think that arguing is solved only when we understand why we're arguing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes we're arguing because we feel insignificant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I feel like I'm not being heard. I feel like um, I'm competing against you. Uh, even in our own relationship, or maybe even especially in our own relationships, we compete against the person. I'm smarter than you, faster than you, whatever it is. Like, it, uh, more, I'm kinder than you, right? I'm more compassionate than you. And it beca- we become martyrs for our own relationship. Mm. Now, Bex, you talked about compromise here in your answer. And... You know, I'm of two minds of of, uh, compromise. I I actually feel very similar to it as I do commitment in Mm -hmm. a way. I feel that it becomes an obligation. In fact, we we feel as though it is noble or virtuous to compromise. And I believe there are times where we have to give up something to get something. And if that's what we mean by compromise, wonderful. If we mean that we must do things repeatedly that we dislike in order to make a relationship work, then I hate that. And I don't want to compromise at all. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Anything to add to that? No. Agreed. That was perfect. (laughs) (laughs) All right, y'all. Well, we got some listener tips today. We also have an added value segment about love. But it looks like we had a bunch more surprise questions this week. Ryan, like, how do you find the balance between being a couple and being individuals? Bex and I, we talk about this one a lot. So I think we'll uh, we'll be able to go in depth on that. That's easy. One person lives in Montana half of the time. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, but what about the other half? Easy. Uh, what are your fears and insecurities as you settle into your relationship? Can you discuss your thoughts on non-monogamy? 
do you really did you really get married or do you just say you're married without the big cost and paper um okay how do you tell your partner how do you help your partner who isn't a minimalist part with material items what is your favorite tinder profile what's in your fun box actual question plus a million more questions for bex and the minimalist if you want to hear all that join us on the minimalist private podcast this week that's right we release a second private podcast episode every week on patreon that's one free minimal episode every tuesday that's the one you're listening to right now and one completely separate long form maximal episode every thursday so visit the minimalists.com slash support to subscribe and get your personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app you also get access to hundreds of hours of archives i mean it just goes way way way, way back you've got a lot of catching up to do dude if we, if I uh, was a listener and not like the host of this, a co-host of the show, mm-hmm. I would sign up just for the biggest failures. Honestly, uh, yeah, the biggest failures segment. So we have guests do. Uh, Bex did hers already. We they they do like a little five minute video about mm-hmm. something they failed on, uh, uh, failed at, and the lessons they've learned from that. So we have got all the archives there, live events, etc. Keeps our show 100% advertisement free, and it's cheaper than a cup of coffee. Visit theminimalists.com slash support to subscribe. Ryan, what else you got for us this week? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hello, this is Morris Bradley Watson calling out of Tampa, Florida, and I just wanted to bring up a line of thought in regards to the selling part of decluttering when it comes to minimalism. The first half is a list of price points to consider when selling some of your unused stuff, and the second half is the philosophy behind why letting go is okay, even when you may not be 100% happy with it. So here are five price points to remember and consider when reselling an item. One, the price you paid for it sans tax. Two, the used price sans tax, which is always half the original price. This is what most people want out of their items, but it's not what they'll always get. Three, the market price for similar items. Four, the price the consumer wants to pay for the item. And five, the price you want or will settle for when it comes to the item. One thing to remember is that you don't actually own anything. That may be a difficult concept to grasp, but let me explain. Everything you buy is a remaining lifetime rental, meaning that when you are no longer here, your lease is up and your stuff is not coming with you. Where it goes from there is up for you to determine while you're still here. But let's say you get a brand new couch for $500 and use it for five years. You may not get $250 out of it. You may only get $50 to $100. But even at that, you have the experience of owning that couch for better or worse. And if you discount the amount you resold the couch for, you can count that as how much you initially paid for it. And if you do feel bad about spending as much as you did initially, Taking off that $100 can help you feel so much better. So wait, you say, if this is a remaining lifetime rental, what happens when I break the lease and I resell it? Now, that's actually a really fun part (laughs) because most times when you break a lease, you have to pay a fee, but in this scenario, you're actually getting paid. But anyway, I found that looking at things this way has really helped me declutter and let go. Hi, my name is Jess, and I have gone from being a shopaholic to a minimalist, and it has completely changed my life. Um, I just wanted to kind of share with you a more effective form of using the one-in-one-out rule that has worked for me so well that I've never even had to make a swap. (laughs) Um, So with the one-in-one-out rule, one really good example is the first step to that being effective is to declutter honestly you know when you get rid of your stuff be honest with yourself like for example for me like my jewelry collection um I had so much jewelry but I only wore like five things so it took like three to four times and I finally decluttered everything and I just have one necklace I have one ring and then a couple pair of earrings and that's it you know so if I see this necklace in the store and I'm just like oh I really want that necklace (laughs) Instead of thinking, well, I'll just buy it and get rid of a pair of socks, it doesn't work that way. If you if you buy a necklace, you have to get rid of a necklace. You have to get rid of a like item. And the reason why that works so well for me is because I have 
reduced my clutter so much that I only own one necklace and I love it so much. It's so special to me. There's no way I would buy another necklace and replace it. So it's just, it's really worked for me. All right, y'all. Since we're talking about love today, I thought for our added value segment, we would recommend a song. In fact, I think we'll play it at the end of the audio version. Sorry if you're watching this on YouTube. Jordan will just play our regular theme song by Peter Doran. Mm -hmm. But there's a song we have here today called Easy to Love by Michael Flynn. Ryan and I saw Michael Flynn. He is the lead singer of a, a band called Slow Runner. Where and did we see him at? He opened for William Fitzsimmons at the Canal Street Tavern in downtown Dayton, Ohio. Oh, yeah, that's right. And it was a really late show. It was really late. And like uh, Fitzsimmons came out. He's like, are you guys ready to be sad? <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, which it, it, You juxtapose him with Michael Flynn's music, which is like really upbeat and kind of like poppy, but the lyrics are so deep. He had one of my favorite albums of 2020. The album is called Survive With Me, which is a great title for a pandemic album, mm, right? Yeah. Survive With Me. Yeah. And I feel like in many ways, back to, you know, in 2020, there was a lot of surviving together, right? If we're not thriving together, we're, we're surviving together. And, and that togetherness has um, certainly made my life a lot better. And I'm grateful for that. So let's listen at the end of this episode to Easy to Love by Michael Flynn, because I do think when love is done well, it is easy. It is simple. It, it requires very little effort to love. Unfortunately, we cloud it up with, uh, we junk it up with uh, complexities, right? Uh, real quick for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Well, sort of. Uh, adjacent to the minimalist, uh, Bex has her new podcast, How to Love. How to Love Show is where you can find it, and uh, we're talking twice a month on the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's the first and the fifteenth. Uh, we've already done a few episodes out there. The third episode comes out next week, and so Bex, um, you decided it's not everywhere. The, the podcast is not wherever podcasts are found. You always hear people say that. Mm -hmm. Listen wherever you find podcasts. Mm -hmm. You can't do that with this one. Nope. This is a private podcast. It is. Yeah. And so um, uh, howtolove.show is the only place that you can find it. Yeah. It's on Patreon. That's right. Yeah. All right, y'all. You can follow The Minimalist on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalist. Follow Bex on Instagram at Minimal Wellness. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. If you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. You can comment on this episode at youtube.com slash theminimalists. And if you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at theminimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails whenever we send those. And if you leave here today with just one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it